every government since the 80s has failed to do anything about this. Every single one. It has got worse and worse and worse and led us to where we are now, which, I, to be honest, I think crisis is generous. Uh, it's, it's a humanitarian emergency. It, it's, it's awful. Um, I, I'm, I'm, as a reporter, running out of words for how bad it is. Where to begin with Britain's housing crisis? And it is most certainly a crisis. From rent switch spiral year after year to unsafe conditions, whether it's cladding which could catch fire or damp and mould, millions of people across the country have their psychology, their everyday lives shaped by their relationship to housing every single day. Vicky Spratt is a journalist at the I newspaper. She's an expert, a specialist on housing and the housing crisis. She's written a new book called Tenants, describing in grim detail just how bad things really are in the UK. Vicky Spratt, welcome to Downstream. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? You good? I'm good. Yeah, mostly good. Start of 2023 off with a bang with terrible housing data, but otherwise I'm well. What's the housing crisis? We're talking about 2023, new start, new, uh, you know, new challenges for, for people and housing's the biggest one, I think, which is why we've got you on. So let's start right in the deep end. What is the housing what crisis? Is the, we talk about this housing crisis all the time. Obviously, some people aren't experiencing a housing crisis. So how are we defining it? Well, straight in with the big question, um, how are we defining it? I think I think the term housing crisis is useful, right? It's a bit like climate crisis. You know what it means. You know that it's bad. But I think it's, sh it's shorthand for quite a complex situation that speaks to different experiences. So I would define it as being most urgently um, a crisis of homelessness, which is rising. Um, the latest data we've got, which has just come out, but it's from the end of last year, suggests that street homelessness is rising. We also know that hidden homelessness is rising. And that data would have been collected before inflation got as bad as it now is. So safe to say we can expect worse from that. So I think that's that's the most urgent element of this housing crisis umbrella clusterfuck mm. technical term. After, after that, you've then got two things that I think are both equally urgent, poor conditions in the private rented sector and in social housing. I go into homes that people should not be living in, week in, week out. They are not safe. They are making people sick. They are covered in mold and damp. I've seen sewage running down walls in children's bedrooms. It's really, really bad out there. Related to poor conditions, we have a shortage of shortage of social housing and also an expanding private rented sector because there isn't enough social housing for people to live in. In the private rented sector, landlords are just putting rents up and up and up. They are, depending on who you talk to, the stats differ, but I think it's safe to say that lots of people are experiencing rents that are being hiked above inflation. I've spoken to people being hit with 40, 50, 60% rent hikes. There is no means of stopping that happening in England. Scotland have imposed a rent freeze. Um, there's just crickets in England on that front. Um, and then there's another element of this too. I mean, there's so much here, right? I can, I can no, say- No, please carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, 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 it's almost like where, you know, you, you say, what is the housing crisis? And you've just unraveled this huge mess that is multi-layered and multifaceted. And I would say then on top of that, you've got the problem with house prices, which have risen beyond wages in, let's say the last 30 years, bar a dip after the financial crisis of 2008 which has meant that it's very difficult for people who want to buy homes to buy them. That has also pushed people into the private rented sector. And that has now also been worsened by inflation rising interest rates because people who have scraped to buy homes at the top of the market and have really big mortgages are potentially gonna see their homes fall in value. And lots of people who have really, really mortgaged themselves up to the hill are now seeing those mortgages get more expensive. I suppose I ask what is the housing crisis as well, because all the things you've just identified, um, homelessness, hidden homelessness, street homelessness, uh, people over leveraged with regards to mortgage debt and so on, 
those are constants, right? We've, we've always had that, basically, to varying extents. And I suppose I'm trying to come at this as um, a critic. If I was a 65-year-old homeowner and I'd been living in the same house for 40 years and I'd paid off my mortgage, I think everything is hunky-dory. I suppose when we say the housing crisis, what is so distinctive about all those things compared to, say, homelessness 50 years ago? Because for somebody who's sceptical, they'd say, well, these are constants of human sort of society, as unpleasant as they are. Well, they're not. That's just simply not true. It's not true. There was a point before the 1988 Housing Act when there were more people living in social housing than there were in privately rented accommodation. So let's assume you are not you for a moment and mm. you are this person you just described. Mm. I meet a lot of them. Interestingly, quite a lot come have come to talks about the book, about tenants, um, which is maybe to their credit. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's not always been like this. Like homelessness now ha it is, is getting higher than it was at its lowest in the early 2000s. Homelessness has not always been this high. We did at one point have a lot of social housing. We've sold a lot of it off. We didn't always have this many people living in the private rented sector. At one point, we actually had rent regulation or rent control, whatever you want to call it, depending on which side of the political divide you're on in this country. It hasn't always been like this. Homes were not always this expensive compared to wages. It wasn't so always like this. How, how would you date it then? Or how would you periodize it? So you just said 1988 because there was this legislative change. But of course, then we see house prices really go crazy after the late 1990s. So if you had to periodize this thing really kicking in as a crisis, when would that be? Okay, we need a timeline, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is all in tenants as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay it out as best I can. I think we have, to, we have to pick a point at which the situation really, really started to be exacerbated by policy. And I would call the 1988 Housing Act, which came in when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister, ground zero for the housing crisis, if you could even call it one housing crisis, um, as, as it, we are currently experiencing it. But before that, I'm gonna go back to, let's, let's go back to the First World War. We're in Glasgow, a lady called Mary Barber is starting to get people together to go on rent strike because there is demand for housing in Glasgow because there are munitions factories there. People are moving there to work. What do landlords do? They jacked up the rents to capitalize on that during a war. Mm. So this movement began, mainly women all came together and resisted the rents, resisted evictions. We ended up with um, a piece of legislation that was brought in by the government, which limited how much rents could be up by. Now that set us up for several decades, I'm not going to go into each piece of legislation, it's all in the book, otherwise we're going to be here all night. Mm. I'd quite like to go to the pub later. Um, set several, bit, several different pieces of legislation, all of which had rent control um, in different iterations. Uh, we ended up before the 1988 Housing Act with something called fair rents, which were rents that had to be set by a rent officer and were fair generally like not what landlords would want to charge. During that period of time as well, we also then post-war and also after the Second World War had, had a huge national campaign of what, what we would have then called council house building, state funded social housing. We then get to the late 70s, 1980s. So we've got social housing for the first time my, my family benefited from that. People living in homes that have basically got them out of slums. Like my my grandma, well, we don't call her grandma. She hates that. She's Nan. I don't know why I'm being, you know, grandma because I feel like I have to be formal. But Nan was telling me they, they were living with her parents, they being her and my granddad, with an outdoor toilet, like her eight siblings all in one house, three bedrooms maybe, this is in South Croydon. The only reason they got out of that, which was slum housing, was because of these homes we were building after the Second World War. So we, we clear the slums, we get people into these new houses and flats. We've got forms of rent control for people who are in the private rented sector. We don't yet have mortgage credit available at scale. That comes later in the 90s, as you've just identified, well, 80s and 90s. So we're in, we're in a better place than we've ever been. It's not perfect. I'm not going to be like, all of that housing was brilliantly designed and totally affordable and available to everyone and no one was struggling. That's absolutely not the case. But things were being done. And private renting, a lot of the homes were in really, really, really poor condition. But there were such things as fair rents and politically the idea of rent regulation was palatable. Then we get to the 80s 
And Thatcher's government come up with the 1988 Housing Act. Now that did several things. Um, and I'd say the most pernicious one was introducing section 21 no fault evictions which are now a leading cause of homelessness so if you're a private renter you'll know a lot about this which is it enables your landlords to evict you at any time you don't have to have done anything wrong it also did away with fair rent tenancies um, and any form of rent regulation and has brought us to where we are now with these things called assured shorthold tenancies which is basically a six to a 12 month standard contract including section 21 you can be thrown out at any time landlords can charge pretty much whatever they want. The idea was to make the private rented sector more competitive. This is obviously classic free market ideology. But what it did was load the power in favor of landlords and take it away from renters. So that has created the instability we have today, in my view. Um, and, and that's one shared by lots of housing experts. It's not only my opinion. At the same time, something else is going on which has created this problem, this sort of dysfunctional relationship between the social housing shortage and the expanding, unregulated, unaffordable private rented sector, that's right to buy. So Thatcher's government also brought in a policy that not all bad enabled council house tenants to buy their homes at a discount from market value. Now, depending on your position on home ownership, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Why shouldn't someone living in a council house have the right to buy it? I mean, we could probably debate that all night as well, but they did it. The problem was they didn't replace the homes that were being sold and they didn't put the money back into councils building new homes. So that's when we start to see our social housing stock diminished. Lots of those homes built a great expense by the state that were sold to people living in them have ended up in the hands of landlords being rented out at a premium. Mm. Sorry, I'm laughing because it's so absurd. Mm. On the private rented market, Something like forty percent in some places, right? I mean, yeah. it's not—it's not a small number. It's like a That's really a significant number. number of them. I think—I think Milton Keynes is the right to buy capital of the country, um, and and what the problem there is now, we have this huge housing benefit bill, which politically can be used to say, "Oh, we should cut housing benefit." Then the problem is not housing benefit. The problem is we don't have enough social housing. Mm. So we are now the taxpayer is is funding private landlords because you don't have enough social homes. So the money doesn't go back into the system. Um, also during that period of time, uh, it, it, was, it was made more, more difficult for councils to, to build social homes. And we had the creation of housing associations, which I think it's fair to say not all of them are bad, but lots of them are, are not well run. And we saw that recently uh, with a huge news story that I'm sure you're familiar with, which was the death of a little boy in Rochdale um, who was living in a housing association home that was mouldy and damp and his parents weren't listened to. So that's that's kind of the potted mm. history. And then I suppose I would add in what happened with credit. I think this is also a really important part of the story. So the kind of big bang and then the introduction of the buy to let mortgage in the 90s, uh, which made it easy to become a landlord and invest in property. And, and the key thing with that is you could borrow against the earnings from the buy to let as opposed to- Your earnings. Yeah. Exactly, which meant you were more attractive to the bank than a first time buyer. And then of course, mortgage credit becoming more widely available, home ownership expanding. I mean, this this slightly predates the 90s, like this is happening in the 80s too. Because that's in 96 with the buy to let thing. Did nobody say this is a bad idea? Like this is really going to distort the market? Was that not like a thing that they thought about? I think I think it's a little bit anachron. I mean, is it, it's easy for us to say that looking back now, but at the time, because the social housing shortage wasn't as bad as it now is, I, I don't think we, <clears> it wasn't, I mean, it, obviously it was a terrible idea, but at the time, where where the country was and where people were, this sort of obsession with using property, not homes, to to make money and homes as as a as a vehicle for profit, not somewhere to live. I don't think that many people questioned I, it. I agree with that, but. You know, you're coming out of Thatcher, like you say, right to buy, which was very popular with a significant amount of the population. You have to just. Well, it right was to... a Labour policy before it was a Conservative policy. Yeah, well, as well. Hugh Gates, because I don't like to think of him as Labour, but I, that's entirely true. It was a true. Labour Party policy. Yeah, 1958, nine. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was a manifesto promise. No, I know, but then you have Wilson doesn't implement it, for instance. So I think you know, I, 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 of course, you're right, and it is very popular with some people, and, and I think you could even make an argument to do it. But like you say, build a company, social housing stock at the same time. 
But anyway, I can see why Rights by is very popular with some people who benefit from it. And you have this enhanced ideology of property ownership and self-reliance and so on and so on and so forth. And then in 1996, they're saying, actually, you know what? We're going to make it easier for somebody to become a landlord than for you to get on the property ladder. And it seems like the one thing that both parties really agreed on, after let's say after 1992, was home ownership, getting on the property ladder, you know, self-improvement, whether that's Peter Mandelson or John Major, Tony Blair or, you know, Kenneth Clark. And yet there's a strange, I'm just, I'm so curious where it came from and, and who drove it and like what think tanks were behind it and what politicians were championing it. Because it seems such a strange thing all of a sudden. No, I mean, do we have any sort of data around? That's a good sort of conspiracy theory, no? To go into, perhaps. A conspiracy theory? I well, mean, like the IEA, like, uh, it's a really remarkable policy to say that we're going to start giving more credit to landlords rather than homeowners, even yeah. though the public ideology is homeownership. But I, I, I think that it's not so much a conspiracy theory, um, although I know that's an attractive way of looking at it and you're quite no, who, right who drove it is the question well well, well that thatcher thatcher drove it, it in its iteration as, as we currently experience it right and she she really 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 did not like social housing and she was a free market zealot so well, i mean the buy to let stuff which is 96 oh i see well i don't actually know i mean i actually don't know whose idea that was we'd have to look it up it's such a big deal but and it's such a big deal but what i will say is I don't think, you, you're saying you think it's surprising, but I don't find it surprising at all. Should I tell you why? Go on. Right. Like, f forget Westminster for a minute. Forget what nerds are bopping around in think tanks. I mean, if you could even call the IEA a think tank. They are technically a think tank. Um, and, and think about what people want in this world. I've traveled this country for years now speaking to people from all walks of life, living in various different housing situations. And the one thing that everybody who is struggling says is all they want is a home of their own. Yeah. When I interviewed my nan for tenants, because I'd spoken to her about this, you know, on and off through the years, but I'd never sat down and actually talked to her about what her upbringing was like. Mm. All she ever wanted was to own a home that she could shut the door on and feel safe in. Because I think that was not something her family had ever had. Mm. Not something that anyone in my family had ever had mm. at that point in time. But so that, that, that's, that sort of compounds what I'm saying, surely. Because like I said, the public ideology, the thing everybody wants is to own a home of their own. And yet the political class congregated on this idea of actually, we're going to give loads of credit to landlords and not to you guys. And as a result, between 97 and 2007, I think the house price to wage ratio goes from something like four and a half to nine and a half. So like, and I, this is really hard for labor people to grasp that actually housing relative to wages became really unaffordable after 1997. It wasn't introduced by Tony Blair. It was the, it was a year earlier, this buy to let mortgage product. Um, but that, and that to me, my experience, I mean, I grew up in rented accommodation, neither of my parents owned until 2006, seven. You know, my mum was a homeowner. She died a few years later, had basically a subprime mortgage. Um, that's another thing we haven't even got to. Well, we'll get to that. We've got a lot to talk about. So, and so I, I, I get all of that, but it was interesting to see them get on the property ladder later in life. And actually, ten, if they'd done it 10, 15 years earlier, it was far more affordable, but because of this broader context. Of well, the they would have made stuff, more money. Well, I, I think I think buy to let was part of the picture. It's not the whole picture. The expansion of, of mortgage credit for people who were buying homes to live in also mm. is a huge part of the problem here too, right? There are more people who, who did that than became landlords. And that did jack up house price inflation Do you think well. buy to let wasn't a major variable in- Oh, I'm not saying it wasn't a huge part of the problem. Yeah. And it's obviously been expanding more and more in recent years. Well, not so much recent years. By recent years, I mean like the last 10, yeah. 15. But I don't think that's the whole picture. I, I, I personally, you and I might disagree. I wouldn't hang it only on buy to let, but I think the deregulation of the private rented sector coupled with rising house prices and the availability of buy-to-let mortgages has caused part of this problem. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's solely that. I think people buying homes that they would live in mm -hmm. and then watching house prices do what they did, which is go like that, you could earn more sitting in your pants at home than you could going to work. It was wild. That mm -hmm. also was part of the problem. 97 to 2007, again, like, it was crazy when you look at average house price increases year on year for 10 years. I understand why all these people look at New Labour, you know, I voted Labour, I'm not, you know, but, and they look at New Labour and go, wow, 
was an amazing time. It's like, this is Goldilocks if you own a property, right? Because yeah, the average house price, I think it went up sort of three, four X in like 10 years, three X. Like well, I think this is not normal. I think this is an important, well, normal. It's not normal. Define not normal. Well, what, prior to that, prior to that, house prices had never gone up so quickly. Yeah, but uh, you can't. You can't. Uh, what I will say on that is, you. I don't. I. I would debate that because I don't think you can say that it's not normal because we, before that point in history, didn't have home ownership for most people. Right? Lots of people lived in mm. pri privately rented. No, the majority of people. We were not a majority home owning country at that point in time. Before ninety seven. So I'm going back to like. Before the 80s. No, 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 I'm talking. I'm talking about 1997 to 2007 over that 10 year period where I think house prices basically go. But when you say three it's, or four x, when you say it's not normal, I think it's atypical. That's that's not happened before or since, right? Right. Okay. 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 I see what you mean. Well, what I'm what I'm trying to say is we're looking at a particularly unique point in Britain's history, right? I, and now we are where we are. It was basically an experiment. If you make mortgage credit, buy to let mm -hmm. credit av available widely and you reduce renters' rights, what happens? That is the experiment. That's not what they meant the experiment to be. Of course. And the left and the right both bear responsibility. Mm. You know, we had we had the Labour government, as you rightly point out, for years, and nothing, this crisis was brewing. All you had to do was look at the stats to see how bad it could get. And they did nothing. We've got a great statistic in the book actually about um, social housing, construction, in like the final year of Margaret Thatcher, was more than any year under Blair and Brown. It's even better than that, actually. Maybe you can remember. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> it's so good. It's probably when you write a book, you forget all these statistics. When you write, well, I wrote this book. I finished this book two years ago yeah. now. So, but but that's but it's an, that is true, and it's an important point, right? Because every government since the eighties has failed to do anything about this. Every single one. It has got worse and worse and worse and led us to where we are now, which I, to be honest, I think crisis is generous. Uh, it's, it's a humanitarian emergency. It, it's, it's awful. Um, I, I'm, I'm, as a reporter, running out of words for how bad it is. And I would say that the end of 2022 was a real low point, um, reporting on the death of, of, a, of a kid in, in social housing was a real low point for me, like professionally and personally. It was a low point. And I think the economics and the politics of it are um, really the story of negligence, political negligence. And even since, you know, more, let's, let's look at more recent history, what I would say, and I've written this regularly at the iPaper in my column, is that the various conservative governments, I can't, I keep, losing track of how many we've had in the last few years, they, they have prioritized home ownership above all else. Mm. And so this is still going on and it's still making people's lives miserable. Um, we've had stamp duty cuts. We've had absolutely nothing to sort out private renting. Mm. We've had some good, good work on social housing regulation, which was in the works long before Michael Gove was appointed Secretary of State for Housing. Uh, but he has got it over the line. So I'm afraid I do have to give them the credit for that. The renters reform bill still seems to be stuck in the long grass. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that would end section 21 evictions, hopefully, um, make it harder to increase rent in tenancy and, and generally bolster renters' rights more. But that has been being promised since 2019. And now we've got rents at historic highs. I'm just going to repeat that again. Rents have never been this high. Mm. I they, mean, last year was crazy, right? Yeah, it was wild. Places like Manchester and not even. We all talk about London, but actually, well, London, London had already hit such a such a peak, yeah. and obviously with with people leaving in the pandemic, although people are coming back, London rents have fallen slightly. But I mean, they're still astronomically yeah. high. So that statistic is almost a bit misleading. But broadly, and again. The data on this is not necessarily reliable. You've got the ONS data, which is patchily collected. That's an experimental index. So I'm not entirely sure how, the, and that's the Office for National Statistics, how they're collecting that data. And then you've got data from the likes of Right Move. So what they record is asking rents, which is how much landlords want to right. charge. And then you've got the data in my various inboxes from people who are telling me what their landlords are trying to charge them. Um, but according to Right Move, I mean, we're looking at broadly like 20% increases last year across the country. And it was outside of London, East Midlands, Yorkshire, mm. Manchester, 
Bristol's been really hard hit. It's it's the whole country. Um, there are some places where rents are not going up at the same rate, but those places have a unique and distinct set of problems in their own right. So last year I was in, in Grimsby, okay, rents there are not rising at ast- to astronomical levels, but the houses that are there are in really poor condition and the place has been completely decimated. And there's a lack of opportunities for the people who live there. So it's 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 a it's important not to talk about the country in in broad brushstrokes because I think there are like localized mm. problems with housing, but broadly with private renting, yeah, that's the picture. Historically high rents. And of course house price inflation is slowing down, but we also have <clears throat> historically high house prices. Just just to, to reiterate that, they have never been this mm. high. House price, housing affordability, if you want to buy a home. Again, this is a bit of an anachronism. I'm reluctant to compare apples and oranges because you, this is why I was p- pushing on the normal thing because I, I, I would say that what we've seen in the last 30 years is uniquely abnormal. It was the explosion of, of credit and an experiment in deregulation that has been a disaster. But, but it's very, you can't really compare it to anything else because it had never happened before. But if we are gonna you know, look at a, a long timeline, housing affordability is at its lowest point since the 1800s. And How- that's relative to wages, presumably. That is, yeah. So, <clears throat> so it's never been less affordable to buy a home. But again, I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to use stats like that, although I understand why they make good headlines because you can't you can't compare an economy that is so so different to the economy we had then. Well, quickly, because obviously you, you're a brilliant journalist and all this stuff. There's lots of I mean I don't like to use that word sort of vignettes, anecdotes, people's stories are really central to this. We'll talk about those as well. You're really great on the data, but then alongside that, you're a millennial who owns a home, which is very rare. Um, I'm a millennial that owns a home, so you know we have a, a, a congruence there, and what. I'd love to hear from you. There's a couple of things, really. Because when I when we bought our home, which was perfect timing, right at the start of the pandemic, it was a buyer's market. Um, people were just really looking to get rid. Like you say, no um, stamp duty. We wouldn't have paid much anyway. But we would have paid some. And then, of course, six months later, you know, we get the mortgage holiday. Just because we fancy getting the mortgage holiday, we're not going to get that opportunity again. And so I'm thinking, well, we've, we've got on the housing ladder. We've avoided paying this tax. We don't have to pay mortgages, uh, our mortgages for three months. Meanwhile, I'm looking at all my friends who rent in London, or my colleagues, my co-workers, their life's not, you know, being, they're not being helped by the state in that in that regard. And then when we go to remortgage after the end of two years, the lender goes, oh, by the way, you can lend against the increase in the value of your house. Mm. And I think, this is, ins- this is nuts. This is completely insane. Like, how do millions of people justify this themselves as like in any way remotely fair? if they have the mildest acquaintance with the rental market. So for you as a, as a fellow homeowner, how did you find the experience of going from the rented sector into a place of your own? I think there's an important story actually about homeowners, and I wouldn't put myself in this category, who bought into the British dream and are being screwed over. Mm. Consider anyone who has bought a flat, a shared ownership or a help to buy a flat with flammable cladding mm. and fire safety issues. Mm. They could be bankrupt. I don't think that buying a home necessarily has made you a winner. And I think that the help to buy scheme based on what I'm now dealing with with my repayments could potentially be another story that's gonna really unfold. And actually, I would reframe the conversation now about people who have bought homes at very high prices and mortgaged themselves up to the hill. Yeah. They're gonna be renting from the bank their yeah. whole lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think the way we conceive of home ownership is gonna to have to change. We're now seeing 40, 45 year mortgages enter the market. Mortgage terms are only gonna go in one direction if house prices don't fall drastically, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure that they will, but let's wait and see what happens. Actually, people who have bought homes in, in recent years who didn't have huge wealth to put into it when they when they did that are not going to be in such a good position. No, I totally agree with you. And I don't know, I don't know what size your deposit was. I don't know what your loan to value is like. I mean, it sounds pretty good if they're offering you more money because they're certainly- we don't, live, we don't live in London, right? That's the yeah. thing. So we- But it depends how much, you didn't have to do help to buy. So I'm guessing you have no. more than 5%, which is great. Yeah. But if you, like me, only had 5% and you did help to buy, 
you don't have lots of money to play with and now rates are rising, house prices might fall and you've got a government loan to repay. It's not a great situation to be in. I'm better off than lots of renters for sure, mm. but I I don't think that everybody who's bought a house is a winner. No, I don't think that, but that's the that's the narrative, right? Well, so but this is this is this is like another scandal that I've been reporting on, right? Actually, what about people who who were sold this dream? Mm. Helped to buy being this sort of you know, it, it sounds like right to buy. I mean, it, you couldn't have designed a better policy. <laughs> another another attempt to win votes by the conservatives mm. and it was popular, but it's not all that it seems when you start digging into it. I actually interviewed one of George Osborne's special advisors who was an architect of the scheme. This was b before, long before the pandemic or maybe it was during, I don't know, I've lost time and space or all mm. warped now. And I said to him when I was interviewing him, I was like, what made you think this scheme was a good idea? Because it looks like it's jacked up house prices. It may not be that good value for money for people. And he was like, well, haven't you paid back your help to buy loan? I was like, dude, if I had that money, I would never have used the government scheme. So you had people in Westminster devising the scheme, genuinely no idea how much money most people have. Mm. I think he's now, I mean, I don't want to get libeled, but he works for um, a big investment fund now. And he very generously gave me his time to discuss his thinking with the scheme. But you know, if I had hundreds of thousands of pounds, I wouldn't have taken a government loan. But these are the people that are sort of basically drive government policy in this country. Like I have a friend who was at the treasury and I think it was in 2014, 15, which is, I mean, I, I know things are bad now, obviously with rent and whatnot, things are worse than ever. But in terms of like the, the sheer vacuity around policy and like just triviality and like barefaced ignorance, for me, it's the coalition government. I think it always will be. He was at the treasury at the time and um, his line manager or whoever it was, the big cheese on their, on their floor said, oh, home ownership, people are talking about it. Who, who here doesn't own a home? And this boy puts his hand up and he was, you know, it, it was the younger sort of members of staff put the hand up and they put, you know, put their hands up and they don't know our home. And the guy's, fuck a duck, there's quite a few of you. Who do you think? These are senior civil servants at the treasury and they're doing straw polls amongst their members of staff. Ob obviously it's, a, it's not a particularly reflective or representative sample of the country more generally. And I thought, wow, these aren't serious people whatsoever. So do, do you think actually, do you think the civil service, party politicians and so on and so forth, the people that are generating policies like help to buy, do, do you think they're making these things significantly worse on purpose? Or is it just about the sort of, you know, okay, we need to just make sure house prices go up another five, ten percent because that's electorally expedient? I think there's several things going on. So I, I, I wouldn't answer the question in the way that you framed it because I think it's more complicated than that. Um, but I would start with saying, I think we have a huge problem in this country with who we hear from and who makes decisions, right? We know that journalism, for instance, is majority still privately educated. The people who become journalists, generally speaking, went to fee-paying schools. So fair to say they probably come from reasonably wealthy backgrounds, right? So for years, they are the ones who've decided what makes the front page. If you went to a fee-paying school, I'm imagining you probably own your home. We know that people whose parents own their own home are more likely to own a home. Bank of mum and dad, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was going on where home ownership was getting a lot of attention, where potentially politicians were not being held to account in the way that they should have been. Um, I certainly felt that way when I started reporting on uh, generation rent, as everyone loves to call it, although I think that's a bit of a pointless term as well. Um, so I think that was happening. And then I think you have that problem mirrored in our politics. We right now have a cabinet that is major majority privately educated, fee paying schools. I don't think they have ever collected data on how many of the cabinet own a home, but I mean, fair to say a lot of them, like same with journalism, right? That stat, as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist. But I imagine based on my experiences early on in my career, I was often in rooms, not only of people who own their own homes, but where very few people knew someone who lived in social housing. I think that's fair to say. Because you were, this is this is public knowledge, it's in the book. You were a sort of junior producer at the BBC. Yes. 10 years ago? Yes. Um, 10 years ago, I'm like checking my age. Actually more than 10 years ago 12 now. years ago, yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> really in the crosshairs of like the early austerity stuff. You were yeah. sort of privy to those conversations. I was, I was there. Yeah, yeah, I was there at major flagship news programmes. 
Um, and I would say, hey, I've got this story I think we should do about people being evicted or whatever. And I would be told it's just not that interesting. Um, and what kind of stories would they sort of focus on instead? Do you have any sort of vivid recollections of, oh, spike that, we're going to do this instead? Do you know you're really, really causing me to like dredge the reservoir of my memory without my phone brain? Um, so I, I can't remember. But what I, we did get a couple of renting stories over the line. But generally speaking, it wasn't that the housing crisis wasn't deemed that interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember what else was going on. There was there was loads of psychodrama back then. I mean, that was the coalition years. Because you um, you you were a, you were a junior producer when, when there was the famous Allegra Stratton interview with no that was before my time before your time but I do talk about that in yeah. the book but I I wasn't I wasn't working on that story no. or or at the show when she did that interview but it was around the same time um, and also this is pre Brexit you've got to remember so actually I can tell you what we were talking about a lot which was whether there should be an EU referendum right. we were talking about that. Day in, day out, week in, week out, far more than we were talking about the housing crisis. I could tell you that much. I remember that much. And that must have been a strange distance for you because you, you're renting at the time. You're a young person. You're seeing lots of, I know generation rent, it's a kind of rubbish term, but I think it captures something, which is people from certain socioeconomic backgrounds you would have expected to get on the property ladder by a certain age. It just doesn't happen after 2007 for whatever reason. And that's those are the kinds of people that you meet at university or just be friends with or social circles or co-workers or whatever. There's that. And then you've got this other world, which is your professional world at the BBC, and they seem entirely separated. Did you ever sort of think, it must have been quite challenging though, because like you've got this official reality and then you've got the thing that you sort of observe and you think, oh, this is, there's this huge incongruence here. When did that sort of really first strike you? I mean, that struck me when I went to university and met really, really wealthy people for the first time. And then we graduated and some people just had these flats. I mean, mm. one, one guy, I remember, like had a whole house in East London. I was like, oh, how'd you get so rich? Yeah, I mean, I always knew that was my reality. It wasn't two realities. That was my reality. But you weren't, no, but the point is, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of rephrase that. I mean, I lived in London for 15 years and I think I must have moved 15 times. So I knew there was a housing crisis, right? And I'd seen so many awful situations with regards to bad housing, road landlords, I've seen it all. And then, like you say, when it comes to the BBC, Sky, ITV, until relatively recently, the conversation is a lot better thanks to journalists like yourself, until relatively recently, it just, it just wasn't of interest. Well, yeah, and I think, I think that, I mean, I don't wanna say that I was the only person talking about it, because that's certainly not true. But I think when I started talking about the letting fees stuff back in, that was that 2017, 2016, mm. that was when the needle did start to move. And we did manage to get letting fees banned. That was a campaign, that, an editorial campaign I fronted for a website that no longer exists, The Debrief. And I think that was a bit of a turning point in terms of actually where the, the idea of generation rent became quite useful was that those editors who did own homes started to see that their reasonably privileged children, grandchildren, couldn't get on get on the property ladder. Another metaphor that I'd love to unpack because when you think about it, it's actually a really messed up way to conceive of housing, mm -hmm. homes, where people need to live. Like it's a ladder that you climb, why? A ladder that you can fall off. Yeah, sounds great, sounds secure. Um, so I think that was like a big turning point. And I think also house prices was getting so high at that point that it started to affect people who are reasonably wealthy. And I think, that probably is when the penny started to drop. But of course, as ever, it was people on the lowest incomes who were the worst affected for the longest and not being given any airtime. Um, and unfortunately, it was when people like me, who, I mean, I guess middle class, university educated, um, able to do a job like journalism, get a book deal, that kind of stuff. If I find class, it's like also not, not always that helpful, it's better to talk sure. about income. Mm. But when I started talking about it, I mean, I sound like someone who could be that editor's daughter. So I think they started listening. It shouldn't have taken that. Of course not. But it did. There's, there's some really powerful stories in the book. I mean, one is um, a woman called Limara. Mm. Could you tell me a bit, a bit about Limara, who she is and, and how you came to meet her? Yeah, I met Limara several years ago now. Her story has a happy ending. Um, oh, that's good. But I will. Start, yeah, start at the bad start, bit first. Start at the bad bit. Um, 
So Lamara, when I met her, was sleeping on her mum's sofa in Peckham. She lived in Peckham her whole life. She had a daughter, Nevea, and she had just been evicted from her privately rented home because um, she was working. At that time, she didn't qualify for social housing, um, even though she'd grown up in social housing. And she was evicted, made homeless, single parent, ended up in temporary accommodation, really, really saw her mental health plummet ended up having suicidal thoughts. Her daughter's mental health was was being impacted by their living situation too. And by the time I met her, she was just at her lowest ebb, as you would be. Um, she'd been through the sort of computer says no system that is trying to access support for months and months and months, been told that she couldn't get homelessness support because she wasn't homelessness yet. So she had to wait to actually be thrown out by bailiffs before she could get support. And then when she did, she was told that she was earning too much. Just she worked at a Starbucks, right? Uh, she was a manager. Manager. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she had a university degree, 25, 26. Mm. She's done everything right. Done everything right. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, she was working at Starbucks as a manager. Then she went into the Nando's management scheme. Right. Um, and they kept telling her that she was earning too much and that she'd be better off earning less and then having more of her rent paid for this crappy temporary accommodation she was in in South London with a shared bathroom, right? Like people who live in temporary accommodation come from all walks of life again. And I'm not gonna say that some people should have support and others shouldn't, but I don't think that people who are requiring support for substance abuse should be put in the same housing as single women with children. I don't think that should happen. That was happening. Is there any safeguarding issue around that? Is there there's a huge safeguarding no, 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 issue. No, of course there is. Yeah. But no, did the council? No, but my point is, is no, the council she meant was, to? Yeah, of course. But it does. But there's nowhere to put people. There's nowhere to put people. So where do they go? It, it's a, it's a mess. Council housing officers have, you know, they make mistakes for sure, and I report on that regularly. Mm. But so this wasn't a mistake. Well, it I wasn't don't, that they I don't think they had. Them. They didn't have anywhere else to put her. Mm. That's the, that's the reality for a lot of local authorities. That's why the social housing shortage is so, so serious. Mm. So yeah, she had a suicide attempt and eventually was given a home which she still lives in. Um, and now she is a housing officer. Oh, wow. And if that's a story she ever wants to tell, she, she should tell it, not me. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason she gave me for that is that she didn't want anyone else to ever go through what she went through. And she now knows that there were things that happened with her case. Like she wasn't given the right information at several points that shouldn't have happened. So I think she's an incredible person and what she's been through, no one should ever have to go through. But sadly, there are thousands of Lamaras. Yeah, and there's a few other case studies as well. Um, there's the mother with seven children. Seven children. The seven children and the inhaler. Oh, Kelly. I don't think it's quite seven. It seven? I think it's five or six. Was it, maybe it's five, because then yeah. it's her and the partner made it exactly. seven. Maybe yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. it was. It's a yeah. it's family of seven. Yeah, Kelly. So, so oh, <laughs> I always find it sorry. I just find <clears> which, <throat> what happened to her really dev devastating still. Um, we're still in touch. I'm actually talking to her for something else at the moment. But basically, Kelly and her family were also evicted by a private landlord in South London. Um, just want to be clear, we're talking a lot about London. This is a national story, but I think the London housing crisis is sort of <clears throat> a, a beast in its own right. Um, and the book also has lots of case studies from around the country. Yeah. Say, yeah. Um, so, but but in London, I, I suppose it has a particular set of problems yeah. um, because historically it's, it, you know, the last few decades where house prices have got particularly high, social housing shortages are particularly bad. Landlord puts the rent up, they can't afford it, evicted. This was in Bromley. They got rehoused in Peckham. So not a million miles away. I've heard worse. I've heard of people being relocated from South London to Bradford, um, for instance. But but pretty bad mm. when you're adding 45 minutes to get your kids to school and you can't afford a car, which was their, their situation. Um, and I think what happened next really speaks to why we have to talk about the human impact of homelessness and not just these broad brushstroke statistics. Like what happens when someone is evicted? What happens when they become homeless? What happens when they become displaced? They're removed from everything they know. They're removed from their support network. They're removed from their local GP system. They might not know where their hospital is anymore. They're taken away from their kids' schools. Everything has to change. 
And Kelly had a son who was asthmatic and he had um, his asthma started flaring up, which she she thinks is because the uh, temporary accommodation they were put in was dusty, quite possible. We know that happens a lot. We know that kids who've experienced homelessness are more likely to have health conditions. Um, mental health conditions and physical conditions went to the doctor, got prescribed an inhaler. Doctor she'd never seen before, didn't know the family, gave them the wrong inhaler, exacerbated his condition. He had an asthma attack, a really, really, really bad one. While they were trying to figure out where the nearest hospital was, he died on the driveway. Crazy. And if you weren't there to tell this story, was it in, in the news as a sort of... I think it was picked up in the news once, um, but but only once. And I, I, th I actually, I think, ironically, she was actually talking about something else. Um, but she she did she did speak about homelessness broadly. But what happened with Morgan, who was her son? I think he was six years old at the time, six or seven. Um, it's devastating. Her life will never be the same. And I wish she was here to tell this story, mm. not me, actually. Um, I'm working on something which I hope is going to involve her telling her own story because she would tell it far better than I ever could. But there's just so many of these. I mean, again, in the book, there's another guy as well called um, Tony. We'll go to him in a minute because I think he's he's a really good counterpoint to the whole generation rent narrative. And, you know, boomers, uh, you know, swimming in money and millennials and Gen Z are under the thumb because that's not, that's not the whole story. But there are just so many of those stories and they don't really feature in our national conversation at all. It's, you know, there's a, there's a Ken Loach film or whatever. But broadly speaking, you know, this is the experience of, well, you know the data, I think, in terms of people that live in poverty in this country, something like 15, 16 million. And, and it's yet, rising. Yeah. And yet we barely hear about it. This isn't the news. You know, a kid who's died because they don't have the right inhaler and can't access health services in, in the way they normally would because they well, were just placed by a landlord. I mean, that should be an, a national scandal. Yeah, it should be, and it is. It is a national scandal. And uh, But I, on a point, on a more optimistic point, I think that the coverage of Awa Bishak's death at the end of last year sure. tells you that something has changed. Because when I started reporting on this, a story like that would not have made headlines in the way that it has. And that's not just because of my work. Um, that's because of the work of lots of other really, really brilliant people and journalists, not not least Kwejo Tenoboa, who has told his story about what happened on the estate he lived, lives in. He still lives there in Mitcham so eloquently. Um, just for anybody who doesn't know about Kwejo's story, he was living in a really, 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 really badly run down social housing flat in Mitcham. And his father was very, very sick with cancer. And they had like water pouring through the ceiling while he was at home receiving palliative care. And Kwejo started talking about it, started tweeting about it. And I think that is partly why these stories now make headlines. Um, Kwejo's story was picked up by an ITV journalist called Dan Hewitt. I think Dan has done a lot to move the needle yeah. too. Um, so I think actually, you know, <clears throat> the housing crisis in all its various iterations is in my view getting worse, but I think it's getting more attention. And I think that speaks to what I was saying before, which is simply it's affecting more and more people. And mm. if it will eventually reach critical mass. Um, I think it maybe is, you know. And But Kwejo has really been a lightning rod for, for, for all of this. And he's taken on people's stories from all over the country. So I do think if, if Kelly went through what she went through all those years ago now, I like to think it would it would be a national scandal in the way that it's absolutely deserving of being, um, because I think what happened in Rochdale with Awabashak and the way that his family have been heard is not something that I would have seen five years ago. The, all that being said, <laughs> is anything going to change? I'm not convinced. Mm. I'd like to think that it will. The social housing regulation bill will go some way to making sure that what happened in Rochdale doesn't happen again. But without a fix for the private rented sector and building social housing at scale, I'm not I'm not sure that meaningful change is is anywhere close. So we, we've talked about younger people, um, children, and also uh, you know women who are millennials um, or younger. The story of Tony is really instructive, and I think it feeds into this broader point. So Tony doesn't live in London, it was Chatham, I think. Kent, somewhere in Kent, was it? He's from Essex. Colchester. Essex, my apologies, Essex. Um, home counties for me are just one big, you know, lump. But yeah, there's somebody from Chatham in the book, isn't there? Kelly's from Chatham. That's right. Um, he's a bit older, 
he's a renter and he's in a desperate situation too. And it really, it really <clears throat> distilled for me something which I think isn't even on the radar of lots of people on the left or even on left media. And it's only become on my radar because I'm writing a book about demographic aging, which is older people who rent have a, a, a sort of double-edged problem with regards to their needs. Because on the one hand, they haven't built up the housing equity to then pay for their adult care needs. Uh, and on the other, of course, they have to pay rent rather than having paid off a mortgage over 30, 35 years. So their outgoings are higher <clears throat> and they have fewer assets to pay off mm -hmm. these care needs. And it seems to me that that's something of a time bomb. If we're now moving away from this model of moderately high you know, um, home ownership, over 30, 40, 50 years, you know, when, when our age cohort retires, and we're probably not going to retire, but when our age cohort hits 65, 70, it, it just seems completely unmanageable to me. The idea that, oh, we'll pay for most people's care needs through the equity in their housing, because of course, well, a lot of people won't have that. It might not be a majority, but it'd be a huge minority of people. So where does that fit into this whole story of older people who don't own and, and, and how they pay for their care needs? Yeah, we're heading towards an iceberg. We're going to crash into it. It was it was a ticking time bomb when I first started talking about older renters back in 2017, according to Citizens Advice, Age UK, Shelter. Now, the number of older renters is increasing and there is no plan for them. And rents are going up, <laughs> wages are not. I mean, where does it end? It, it ends really, really, really badly with people... Um, living in homes that they can't afford with very, very, we know that renters have less in savings than homeowners. So without a safety net to fall back on, without enough social housing, if they can't for whatever reason pay that rent, homes that aren't easy to adapt, private landlords can't, can't easily adapt homes and don't. Um, that's another big problem for an aging population of renters. Yeah. It's a huge, huge disaster, and I don't think anyone's really thinking about it. So you said it's an iceberg we're heading to. We've been heading towards for 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 a, for a long while. I mean, what what does that look like then? I mean, how, how does that how does that get to the forefront of the conversation? Do you think we're going to start having influencers in their sixties who all of a sudden shift the conversation, like you just spoke about a moment ago, as we've seen amongst younger people? Or yeah, I do think it's going to look like that. I think it could be quite because cool, I right? think I think what what happened. You know, the campaign that I ran, Make Renting Fair, which got letting fees banned, that was pre-TikTok. So that was basically me on Instagram and Twitter talking about the fact that I couldn't afford the letting fees that I'd just been charged. And I think social media played a huge role in that. With Quajo, he's been able to film bad conditions and put them up on TikTok and Twitter. I think that's played a role in that. I think what we're now going to start seeing is people saying, yeah, I can't afford my rent. There's nowhere for me to go. And when we're all old and embarrassing on whatever social media platform exists at that point in time, I do think that's what people will be talking about. And I would also throw into the mix, and I've alluded to this, is with this growing mortgage crisis, people who can't afford their mortgages, if something doesn't change. I mean, my personal view based on the opinions of economists I've been interviewing recently is we're probably not going back to ultra low interest rates mm. ever, mm -hmm. certainly not soon, mm. but potentially ever. What does that look like too? It's, it, there is a crisis of an expanding and aging population of renters. Also, let's not forget that those who are not yet in old age like Tony have kids and renting with kids is also particularly difficult. But then you are gonna have people who don't have loads of equity in their homes and have really, really high mortgages. And by the way, those people exist. I just had a story come out this week for the iPaper about mortgage prisoners. Hundreds of thousands of people who took out dodgy mortgages before 2008. Yeah, my mum was one of them, yeah. Who was who was her mortgage lender? It was Northern Rock. Right, okay. But they, they had a, they have a new name now, right? Well, yeah, a lot of those a lot of those loan books were sold on to to new lenders. So But it was a it was like a state-owned entity. Yeah, Northern Rock's a specific example. I mean, some of the, anyone anyone who's in that situation is in dire straits, right? Like a lot of them are on standard variable rates. Those are now really really expensive. Mm. A lot of them are older. It's so sad. Well, it's brutal. It's I mean, so but the sad. reason the reason I've been covering it is because I spent a day at the um, Croydon County Court sitting in on eviction and repossession hearings. Mm. And these dodgy mortgage lenders who existed pre-2008 are now trying to repossess homes. As interest rates go up mm. and people can't afford to pay their interest-only mortgages. Mm. So I think 
I'm not I'm not comparing that to the situation of people who've say taken out a 95% mortgage at a very 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 high point of high house price inflation um with with yeah with a small deposit I'm not comparing it they're, they're distinct and distinctly different but I do also wonder not only do we have a population of aging renters I think people won't have the same capital to take out of their houses when their mortgages if their mortgages even run out right like yeah. I think there's another version of the future Gosh, this is miserable. 2023. Well, I, think, I think you'll get so bad it's going to change. But yeah, okay. I mean, I look at this day in, day out. Yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is really bad. And um, it is it is really bad. And I and I think we could potentially end up like Japan where mortgages get passed down through families. Because you won't be able to, if house prices don't fall substantially and wages don't rise, you won't be able to borrow huge amounts of money at higher interest rates. So the way to make it affordable, quote, in the language of the banks, is to extend the term. And that's why we've gone from 20, 25 year mortgages being the norm to 30, 35 now, moving towards 40, 45. I mean, Boris Johnson was, Johnson was talking about before he was booted out wanting 50 year mortgages, that that's how they're gonna fix it. But the, the, the knock on effect of that is that people are borrowing more for longer and paying more interest on it. So retirement, even for homeowners, unless they're wealthy, doesn't look like it would have looked. And unfortunately, our care system still relies on people having some of their own money. I mean, you, you kind of, I mean, the stuff you, this, I'm, I'm not being glib here, the stuff that you're exposed to, it almost sounds like low level conflict journalism. Like the sort of, the sort of trauma that people are going through on a daily basis in terms of engaging at the bottom end of Britain's housing system. It does seem like low level conflict. It, no, not war. That's obviously, that is melodramatic, but you know, is it? Well, war, I think, is I, constant I, I, death, I suppose. Yeah, but it's, not, okay, it's, getting, it's on a spectrum, right? But I'm not going to, okay, obviously I'm not going to compare being um, in in a war zone to this, because again, I think we'd be comparing apples and oranges. Mm. But I think the studies on this speak for themselves. This is trauma. Mm. People who are evicted suffer with PTSD. Mm. They're more likely to have a suicide attempt. Mm. It is trauma. It is a conflict of a kind. It's an economic oh, one sure. and a political one and a social one. And it ruins lives and it ruins people's health. I mean, we also know that renters are, this is a study that I talk about in the book, um, brilliant academic called Amy Clare. She took blood samples from social tenants, private tenants and homeowners and measured them for this thing called CRP. Um, it's it's a protein that, that, that sort of tells you how much inflammation there is, right? And inflammation is a marker of disease. If you have high levels of CRP, you're more likely to have cancer um, and other, other health conditions. It's a sign that something is really wrong. Private renters have higher CRP levels than homeowners or social tenants. We know this is making people sick. It's, it's, not, it's not hypothetical, it's real. And I go into these homes, I go into these courtrooms, I see it week in, week out. I would love, I would actually love to not do this job. I'd love for there to be know. no need for it. Well, of course, yeah. You're doing very important work. So. Well, thanks. But it's, but it, I'm, I'm just a conduit for these of stories, course. right? But I'd, I'd love to move on to something else. And I didn't think when I started writing about housing. I mean, Tenants was what, five, six years in the making? That book, that's how long that book took. Because it follows people through several years in their lives. Up, so people have a visual cue. Where's the camera? There you go. So people know. It's um, a very good book. Thank you. But I didn't think when I started, my concern when I started it was that by the time it came out, there'd be no need for it. How wrong I was. Mm. Things are worse now. <laughs> yeah. If I don't laugh, I I genuinely some some days it's not about me, but that after that day in court, I just started sobbing. Mm. What else can you do? What what else can you do? What else can you say to people? I don't I don't know. I'm like I said earlier, I'm running out of words for it. Yeah, I mean we're going from bad to worse here. I mean quickly about uh, property guardians, because this is where it gets even more like crazy to me. Is that you know you talk about the experience of people who are property guardians. One, one is a teacher. We have key sector workers, people who society depends on, and they're living in these these what do you call it? Not a doss house because that's being d dismissive to the people that live in them. They're not they're, these are very good people, but like the, even a slum isn't a correct sort of term in terms of the experience you talk about from a um, uh, a, a neglected, empty 
former nursing home and mm. some of the things that happened there. I mean, can you just talk about this with Camelot Properties, I believe? Well, for anyone who doesn't know what a property guardianship is, perhaps it's useful to outline Please, yeah. what it is, right? So these are empty buildings. I mean, I've seen police stations, former electricity power stations, but also empty blocks of flats, schools, um, which are often, but not always owned by local authorities, which are managed by guardianship companies and then rented out to people. If you live in one, you're in theory, although lawyers dispute this, you're not a private renter, you're a licensee, you have fewer rights, you can be evicted at any time. Although there are some brilliant lawyers who would argue, um, one being Giles Pika on Twitter, nearly legal, he's a housing encyclopedia, that actually property guardians have the same rights as renters, but guardian companies argue that they don't. So local authorities or people who own property tell guardian companies to rent out these properties, fill them with people, and that's a way of making money while they sit empty before they're demolished or redeveloped or whatever. People who cannot afford private rents, particularly in cities, although not all guardianships are in cities, mm. think, ah, oh, for 600 pounds a month, I can still stay in the city. Um, so they end up becoming property guardians. But often these homes are really not that cheap for what they are. Bearing in mind, you might have one of those sort of telephone box showers. I don't know if you've ever seen one. It's like a plastic cubicle that you can put in a room. So it has a shower. It's not a real bathroom. Um, you might have shared facilities. You might have no heating. Um, I did an investigation. This was also for the eye paper a few years ago where I pretended to be a prospective guardian viewing a school. This was in London. And I will never forget um, the woman showing me around from the guardian company was like, yeah, so there's no heating. Um, I was like, cool. She was like, but we'll give you it. We'll give you a heater. I think you have to give us like hundred pounds. We'll give you. We'll give you a heater for the room. I was like, right. So there's no heating. I was like, where's the shower? God, to show me the shower. A little phone box shower. I was like, how many people have to share this shower? She'll be oh, about twelve. It's like Oliver Twist, but worse. That's the that's the that's the sort of impression I get. But, is that but, it's not but, even a slum doesn't even that, do it justice. That school that was a primary school that was owned by a local authority as well. And because rents are so high, a lot of the people I've interviewed who live as guardians are key workers, spoken to teachers, nurses. It's, but it's not crazy. But it's, what, what it, I think that's it's the, the thing. If, the it's, yeah. it, it, if you think about it now, where we are, this is the logical endpoint. Of course. Um, but, but, but it's so wild that it has been allowed to, to, to get here. Um, Can you and, go into the details of the nursing? Because this, is, this was like surreal once you got into the details of this because basically there's a couple of this is the nursing home also in Essex please yeah <laughs> again I laugh because I don't know what else to do yeah. but basically <laughs> sometimes when you say these stories out loud they sound like fiction yeah because you um you know you couldn't like it doesn't sound believable yeah you it's like gonzo journalism or something I mean, it's... yeah or, or you know a, a dystopian novel yeah. about what happens when the world falls apart yeah. but no this is this is now so care home in essex that had been condemned by the cqc care quality commission because it wasn't fit for people to live in all the boilers were broken it was a mess there was obviously other stuff going on beyond the structural problems with the building but structural problems with the building were a big part of why it was no lo longer allowed to operate as a care home gets taken over by property guardian company. I'm not gonna say which one, because it's all in the book and that was all legal, so people can read it there. Um, You're very astute. I wish I, I wish I was that smart sometimes. Carry on, sorry. Um, and <laughs> they start renting it out to people. It's a huge, huge, huge place. I think at one point there were maybe 40 or so people living there. Um, again, sharing showers and bathrooms. And it all starts to fall apart. There's no heating, there's raw sewage running around. Like the people who are living there were sending me videos of this. Raw sewage just flooding corridors, um, dire living conditions. And they're complaining, they're not really getting anywhere. One day it all comes to a head because completely by chance, fire service come to check thinking it's still a care home and realize that the Guardian company has not been running any of the fire safety tests they're supposed to be running if people are living there. This was post Grenfell, Grenfell Tower Fire, again, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, a really um, equally should, should not be true story about people dying because a building wasn't fire safe. And they haven't been running the correct checks. So 
fire service say, you're all going to have to leave. You can't live here. The, the, we start we start relating the story in the book through the... the and by the way, the rent wasn't that cheap, sorry. It was like 450, 500 pounds yeah. a month. That's, that's not that cheap yeah. for a death trap. Yeah. The protagonist yeah. moves in. She's like the first person moving in. I mean, almost... It, it's... It's like if Hunter S. Thompson was like a landlord, it would look like this. It's just un unreal. She moves in, not not a great situation, but okay, she's there. And like you say, it's going to be condemned, has all these problems, and they proceed to move another 30 people in. It's like, okay, well, if maybe five people lived there, maybe this was plausible. Mm. But it's that interface of like, dangerous, ignorant, stupid. But then like, she agreed, five people shouldn't be living there, but okay, they want to live there. There's a service that's, you know, the the, 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 the the property itself is being, I think, I think squatting should be legal, but park that, you know, it's doing what a guardian company says it's going to do. But then the pure malicious greed to stick 30 people in there, I just think is, I, I personally think people should be locked up for that sort of stuff. And I know you said you don't want to name the company and so on. Well, but they, the, the, well, interestingly, the company, okay, several things to pick up on here. Let me try and take, Please. let me try and take them each in turn. Let's just initially quickly scroll back to squatting. So I think what's interesting is that property guardianship started popping up after squatting was made illegal. So what property guardianship is, is kind of squatting 2.0, except the people who own the buildings make money from it. Right? And it's less safe by the sounds of it. I mean, I well, squatted a bit and it sounds less safe. So there's that. And then I think there's this other point. Um, which is, okay, so so was there crimin criminality in this situation? Well, yeah, yeah, there was. But the company <laughs> did what's called phoenixing, which is where you just dissolve the company and then nobody can do anything about you because you don't exist. And then they reformed under a new name. That's it. The, the Andrew Tate thing about laws don't apply to so wealthy, but sorry to mention his name, but this 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 ideology which I think is personified by some really grotesque people. I mean, it's it's actually kind of like a, mm. it operates at the everyday level of our economic model, well, yeah. this kind of stuff. Well, what I would say is before before they phoenixed, several of the guardians I was involved um, in talking to them while this was going on did get what are called rent repayment orders, um, RROs, which anyone who is in a bad housing situation could, could look into um, because their home was unsafe and laws had been broken, they were able to get. RRO, so they did get money back. And Nicola, who you're referring to, mm. who's the, the the main guardian who I spoke to the most at this particular property, um, she really led the charge on that, and she got a check, um, getting back most of her rent. So actually, there is there are systems in place, but that company still operates just under a different name. I just don't see how when when you read that that anecdote, I just don't see how the people responsible for that how they don't have criminal records. I just find it. Sort of well, this is like, and again, thing. I'm not going to say too much about this because actually I think what's going to happen with Grenfell will be very interesting to follow. The fallout of the Grenfell inquiry, sorry, I should say, I shouldn't use shorthand, um, will, will be interesting to follow in, in coming months. Um, but as, as things stand, I mean, nobody, 72 people died, mm. nobody's in prison. Um, that may well change, I don't know. And it's not something I'm in a position to talk about at this point in time. But that also speaks to this problem, right? Like... We're talking about homes when we talk about housing. We're talking about where people live, where they wake up every day, where they go to bed, where they ought to be safe, where you should be able to be completely vulnerable in every single way. And unfortunately, the way that lots of our housing stock has been managed has created laws that don't protect people. It's got rid of laws that did protect people. And then layers and layers of bureaucracy, which prevent those being held accountable and particularly egregious examples of um i suppose what i would call the like neglect of basic living standards it stops them being held accountable um and that's that's where we are and there's a brilliant book about this particular subject on grandfather that i'd really recommend by peter apps and he was covering the inquiry relentlessly he knows more about it than anyone and i think grandfather it's at once become a bit of a symbol of the housing crisis, but I'm quite keen to say that what happened there was very specific in the same way that what happened at this care home in Colchester was quite specific. But I think the, the story of bureaucracy and the story of how difficult it is for people to make a complaint at Grenfell 
um, does speak to also what we're seeing with the building safety crisis, where there are still homeowners trapped in unsafe buildings. You know, it goes on, and often it's people hiding behind corporations, um, and it, it should never have been allowed to happen. And 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 also the death of Bawa Bashak speaks to that too, right? Those were immense failings on the part of a, of a housing association um, to to deal with something as basic as black mold. Black mold, I say basic, I see so much of it, mm. it's so common. Black mold is a serious threat to your health. Um, but it, but actually there is a sort of, um, there's been this bureaucratization of the way that housing is managed. And I think it's prevented very, very basic things like fire safety uh, being being easy to achieve. And, and that works in the la uh, leasehold freehold system too, with a lot of these blocks that are co covered in cladding and have other fire safety defects. There's for years been this debate that is basically a, a modern story of feudalism about who's responsible. Is it the immensely wealthy freeholders who own mm -hmm. these blocks or is it the leaseholders who've bought homes in them and don't really own them? Because if you're a leasehold homeowner, you don't really own your home. You've just paid for the right to live in it for however long. I never understood that. Mm. You, I have the lease for 99 years and then you buy it up. I don't quite get. Well, there's reform There's reform there now. Um, so that system is changing. But yeah, that was the system. I mean, it, it's modern feudalism. It's still feudalism. It never went away. Mm. That's that's where that comes from. And w so you buy, this, you buy this flat or this house, Aaron, from me, right? I want 500,000 pounds. Thanks so much. Don't care whether I get it from you or from the bank. And you don't really own it just to be clear. So you only own it for 99 years. And every month, I'm gonna charge you rent, as well as your mortgage. And on top of that, I'm gonna charge you a service charge because I've got another company that's gonna manage the building. I mean, there are millions of properties. But by the that, way, right? if anything goes wrong with the common areas or with the outside, if it should turn out that this building is covered in flammable cladding, yeah. I'm gonna bill you. Yeah, the liabilities on the uh, the tenant effectively they are a tenant, right? Yeah, you are a tenant if you're a, if you're a leaseholder. Yeah. Yep. There's so many properties like that. I mean, like when I was, my my dad was buying a place and it was like 99 year lease. I was like, Dad, I don't think that's. Don't think that's well, the, the the leasehold reform is good, and and I'd encourage anyone who's in that situation to check it out because what ground ground rents will, will will be limited, and being a leaseholder will not be as disastrous as it once was. But for anyone, um, you know, for the for the thousands and thousands and thousands of people trapped in unsafe buildings who are still really waiting for that to be sorted out. Even though, again, Michael Gove, I know I sound like a Michael Gove fan. He has, he has, he Somebody's has- Somebody's got to, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, it's my job to report on what the government does. Yeah. And they have on this, he has really pushed things forward. Um, there's still work to be done and lots of buildings are still unsafe, too many. But at least finally, however many years after Grenfell now, where are we? Five, six, seven? I lose track. Again, it's like time has stopped with, with housing. The most basic almost, thing almost in the world. Almost six years, yeah, it's ridiculous, Yeah, it's right? six, it's six. Time has stopped, <laughs> nothing, nothing gets better, it gets worse. And that shouldn't be happening. I don't think we'd accept it with anything else, right? We would, I just don't think we would. No, it's remarkably strange. And it's meant to be like, quote unquote, service. And if any other service was administered like this, I think. Yeah, you know, but then- but then Consumers would be up in arms. I wonder why that is. And I, I actually have a column coming out this week on it. And I think it's because actually, I spoke earlier about Mary Barber and we have a long, rich history of rent strikes in this country. Now it's very difficult to go on rent strike because of section 21, you just be chucked out. And if you're chucked out and you're in rent arrears, you could end up in court. If you can't repay those arrears, like those people I was sitting in court with, you can end up with a CCJ against your name, mm -hmm. which means it's very difficult for you to get help in the future, let alone rent somewhere else. So I think that's also part of the, the issue, right? It's very difficult for renters, particularly those who having a CCJ would be a big problem for, to protest in a meaningful way. Do you think rent strikes are a bad, bad idea then? Well, I think I just answered that question. Well, no, I suppose no, but I suppose in certain circumstances they could be good because you'd well, go up to a certain point where, if it looked like you were going to get a CCJ, yeah, of course you pull back. But if you've got the money to repay the rent you've leverage. withheld, yeah. If you've got the money to repay the rent you've withheld, I would never sit here 
and tell anyone to risk being able to rent somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's bonkers. That's one of my big problems with the rent strike conversation. Yeah. However, that being said, um, I covered the student rent strikes during the pandemic and people were quite rightly saying, well, I can't pay rent for somewhere I'm not allowed to live. And I think that as a movement did affect change. So what I think is irrelevant I think what's happened when people it's not have, you're a housing journalist. I'm a housing journalist. You have a very good idea about what could work or not well, work. Well, I, yeah, I, I, but I think that's like I think student accommodation and, and private renting. If you've got kids and you don't have loads of money and you can't fight a CCJ or whatever, I'm not going to encourage people to do that. It's not my position to. It's my job to report on what people do. So I guess what I'm saying is I can understand why there are no rent strikes at scale. Um, and why people would be very afraid of doing that quite rightly. But I have also seen when students mobilized, what that was able to achieve, which is them being let out of contracts and not charged huge, amount, huge amounts of money. And of course, as I said before, we've ended up with legislation that regulated rents as a direct result of what women, it was mostly women did in, in Glasgow during the First World War. So when people speak up generally, they are heard one way or another. But I think with private renters, politically organizing would be very diff difficult because it's quite a disparate group of people. Um, and a lot of them, the ones who potentially need help the most, you know, they're not people who could take time off work to protest. I mean, protest, I, I, I increasingly think of as a privilege actually in that respect. Um, I had to define protest. Oh, now we're getting into a, no, a whole other conversation. The whole, the whole literature of like, quote unquote, contentious politics, which is, you know, riots, protests, strikes, and they're all on a spectrum. And Right. I mean, I, but we're specifically talking about going on rent strike, which is not yeah. paying your rent. That's, yeah. that's, that's what we're specifically yeah. talking about. And I think being able to do that and risk being homeless, mm. potentially for quite a long period of time, and having a CCJ, which would, as I said, make it difficult for you to get help, let alone rent somewhere else or ever get a mortgage. Mm. I think being able to put yourself in that position is a privilege because you'd have to have huge amounts of money and not be worried about it. That's that's what so, I'm saying. So what what should people do then? So if, if somebody out there is a renter and they're watching this, and I hope this gets lots of views, you know, some of our interviews have gone very far and wide. I was stopped by a lady in, in a cafe in Portsmouth and I watched your interview with Gary Stevens. I said, Fantastic. Well, I if got recognised while I was changing into my swimsuit at the gym there last week. And I thought it was so nice. But also I would much have rather that I had had clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> if this is viewed by lots of people and, and renters in the kind of situation you're talking about, and they say, yeah, you know what, actually, I don't want to CCJ and I want access to credit in the future because that's the right thing to do. So what do they do then? Let's say, they, like you said, they have got limited time. Maybe one, one hour, two hours a week. What can they do to improve mm. their circumstances with regards to the housing crisis? Well, I'm loath to give anyone advice. I'm a journalist. It's my job to tell stories. It's my job to hold the government that we have to account and the opposition and all politicians, regardless of who they are. That's my job. So I'm not a housing advisor. There are great organizations that provide advice, shelter, citizens advice, crisis. Um, and they have brilliant templates on their websites about what to do if you are hit with a rent hike or an eviction, what your rights are. But as I say in the book, you know, people are taking things into their own hands. And I think that looks like grassroots movements, tenants unions mm. that people are joining. And I've reported on that at length too. Um, the book begins with a, an eviction resistance in Brighton, which is organized by the union ACORN. So I think we're seeing the answer to that question, which is, unable to get the support they need from the state, unable as an individual to maybe take the action they would want to take, often for financial reasons, people are coming together. And that looks like giving each other advice, that looks like free legal advice, that looks like eviction support, that looks like picketing letting agents who have done things they shouldn't have done. I hear about that all the time still, breaches of the Letting Fees Act, shouldn't be happening, it's called the Tenant Fees Act, banned letting fees. So I think what I think people should or shouldn't do is kind of irrelevant. I'm interested in what people are doing mm. and that looks like coming together. But of course there are other, are there are other levers you can pull, right? Because I, I have a bit of a problem um, when I write about the organizing and the grassroots support and I keep coming back to it, which is 
to me, that's a symptom of the gaps in the welfare safety net. Legal aid, deserts across the country. Yeah. There are parts of the country where you can't access a housing lawyer. Yeah, great that people are joining tenants unions and coming together and supporting mm -hmm. each other. But once they would have been able to access free legal support, that has been taken away. So I come back to the same thing, which is actually that the gaps in the state that have been allowed to appear by unraveling the safety net need to be addressed. And I think we forget that there is, well, there are two things you can do always, right? You can vote and you can write to your MP. You can, often it might not be read, but sometimes it is. And that can get something raised in parliament that can drive change. I've seen it happen. So I think there are other levers to pull, other levers to pull too. But with all of this, I come back to the same thing, which is like, I constantly refer people to shelter, to all the great charities I just mentioned, to tenants unions, mm -hmm. but it feels to me quite Victorian. We, before we had a welfare state, and I talk about this in the book too, you know, we had this real resistance to creating a welfare state and state support for people. And some of the arguments against that were based on this idea called noblesse oblige, which is that the wealthy will always help those who have less. And I think that's quite a central tenet of conservatism, actually. That's kind of what I'm saying, right? Oh, there are all these great charities. <laughs> these are all symptoms of the problem. And I would, I would love we know that renters don't vote in the same numbers yeah. as homeowners. Which is, a, which is a new phenomenon, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I would encourage all of, you know, immediate support, short term, do all those things, look into mm -hmm. all those things. Long term, show up show up and vote and, mm -hmm. and engage. Um, I reported on this at the time too. I, you know, I remember sitting down with John Healy, looking at Labour's points on housing um, for that manifesto, it was really good. 2019? Yeah, 2019. Mm. John and I sat down in his office, drank Yorkshire tea and went through it. And every housing expert that I asked for a comment on the contents of that housing proposal thought it was brilliant, regardless of their political persuasion. So we need to do something which looks more or less like that? No. Encourage people to vote for it. That, no, but as a, as a, as a country, yeah, yeah. That according to those housing experts, that's the kind of policy that a government which wants to address this crisis would that it would begin to look like. If you if you wanted to address the housing crisis in a meaningful way, yeah. you would have some of the things that. When were I say in that we, manifesto. I mean you know, the United Kingdom, not you and I. Well, when, when I say you, I mean one, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. If you if you are someone who has entered politics yeah. and you want to address the housing crisis in a meaningful way, yeah. you would look at if if you didn't want to get rid of right to buy you'd look at limiting it or replacing the properties that are sold. You'd look at reforming the private rented sector. You would look at all of these problems as a whole. Um, there was a very radical proposal actually that, that um, John Healy and Jeremy Corbyn put forward, which was setting house price inflation targets. Which seems so sensible. It's an interesting proposal for sure. It seemed, I mean, I can, I can imagine a centre-right politician in like the Netherlands or Germany or like Scandinavia saying that it doesn't seem particularly well I'd love to I mean I'd love to have heard more about it and mm. obviously manifestos are manifestos right like you don't necessarily always have the working on how it would look and what that would have meant for our economy in its current iteration which relies quite heavily on mm. house prices rising which mm. I think is not necessarily a good thing but it's it's where we are which is why house price inflation has been prioritized with things like stamp duty cuts. Again, I argue this regularly in my columns. I, I don't think it's um, a contentious point. It's on the Bank of England website. When house prices rise, people spend more money because they feel richer and more confident. That's why we want house prices to go up. But as we're now seeing, all it takes is a few things to happen globally and domestically. And then that starts to look like a bit of a house of cards. But I think house price, just to bring it back to house price inflation targets, it's an in, it's an in, it was an interesting proposal. Um, that was maybe the most sort of, I want to use the word radical, but I really also don't like that word because I think it's so loaded. I thought that was the most forward thinking piece of, of the proposal that I read. But everything else was, yeah. Why have we not already done that? And that, that was stuff that people have been calling for for years. Sort out right to buy, sort out social housing, regulate the private rented sector, do it now. Um, this, is, this is not new stuff. This is pe things people have been saying for 
10, 20 years. And if they are anywhere near as tired of saying the same thing over and over again as I am, I can imagine what that must feel like. But for some reason, it doesn't happen. For some reason. So that the landlord lobby is incredibly powerful. And it's about who walks the corridors of power and what they know about, as you, you know, said earlier, the lived experience of people. And if you've never been evicted and had to worry about where you're going to go, if you've never had to worry about getting a CCJ, maybe this stuff doesn't matter to you. Vicky, will end there. You said you might get tired of uh, talking about it. I hope the politicians get tired of hearing about it and execute some changes. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me.